That same extra heat energy, of course, as you know, also pulls the moisture out of the first uh, many centimeters of the soil and results in longer and deeper and persistent droughts like the one that affects 97% of the state of California uh, in my country, the Korean uh, Peninsula, much of Southern Africa all right now, uh, and there are other places around the world. In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Marco Simonetti, an engineer and director of an innovative water sourcing company called Aquaseek, based at the Turin Polytechnic in Northern Italy. Marco and his colleagues have been developing a natural polymer derived from algae that draws water from moisture in the air. I asked Marco if it can play a role in the growing, desperate search for new sources of water as we move forward into a drier world. I'll be discussing more innovations and challenges on the subject of water shortages as a near-term threat in forthcoming episodes. Hey Marco, okay. it's good to see you. Good to see you too. I want to ask you about the technology that you're developing, Aquaseek. Can you tell us a little bit about how the technology works? What makes it different from other water harvesting technology? Oh, yes, sure. Well, Aquaseek technology is based on absorptive material. That is a material that is capable of uh, absorbing vapor directly from air. And like a sponge, it is like uh, taking it from air. And then, like when a sponge is uh, full of water, our material is full of this vapor capture. To release it and to have it uh, available for condensation, we have to heat up the materials. So basically, our technology is based on an intermittent process where we first, we take water from air, leveraging this material, and then we heat it up and make a, a closed loop of a condensation of the water. This type of technology is very effective at very low humidity, while other systems that are on market are not. Like you can use a chiller, for example, a heat pump machine, and uh, the chiller would uh, cool down the air at, uh, in some situation where the air is uh, quite humid. While you are cooling down the air, you will have condensation of water. But when the air is very dry, like in some dry area of the desert or something like that, when you cool down, you can reach temperature lower than zero degrees before you have some condensation. At that point, you are icing the machine and the machine won't work longer. So the first advantage is that sorption-based machine can work at very, very low humidity. We demonstrated it in a Texas desert and at a temperature that is minus seven condensation temperature that corresponds to 10% humidity at 30 degrees uh, centigrade, so very, very dry air. And the second advantage of the system is that uh, it is very efficient and uh, can be driven by low heat, uh, low temperature heat, like wasted heat from any power generation system or any engines, or can be driven by, for low temperature, I mean 60 degrees, 50 to 60 degrees, and that is also a temperature that is easy to achieve with a solar thermal system, simple solar thermal system, or with a heat pump. And the heat pump can be driven by electricity that you can generate by photovoltaics. In this type of technology, the absorption, we developed two patents. And uh, by leveraging these two patents, we are the best of the absorption technology <laughs> to our knowledge. You've talked about scenarios in terms of temperature, a desert. One of the things we're seeing at the moment is vast reductions of groundwater across Europe. And this is obviously is going on in the rest of the world too. Is there an application for this for replacing sources of water that we might use for irrigation, for example? Physically, yes. Like atmosphere on a global level contains more than six times the water that is uh, containing all the rivers we use and we rely on for fresh water. So physically speaking, it's, it is possible even to uh, substitute fully the, the water we normally uh, use for any activities. And that will be like automatic and sustainable balance of atmosphere. But anyhow, we are not looking for that. We are looking for having available an alternative source when there are issues. So the full landscape will be a combination of technology like in any other topics. But yes, it will be possible. But the thing is that condensating water from air comes at a cost. So we need to use energy to condensate. We can use 
wasted heat. In that case, the energy will be for free, but there will be the need of available wasted heat somewhere. Or we can use renewable energy. And so we will have no emission, but we will need an investment cost for it. Okay. So the point of this is uh, in on economic level. So technically speaking, it's possible to which extent depends on economic discussion and, and development on the industry, I think. Okay, so from the economic side, then, if you're talking energy is one cost, what about the actual material itself and how durable is it? I mean, does do you have to change it regularly? Does it last for a long time? What we do know, as we started to use this material like three years ago, and we start using it cycling, what we do know, even we are also making artificial aging process, so more cycling than they actually need it. We do know that it should last some years. So the materials we are using is based on a natural polymer, and that is the alginate, sodium alginate that comes from algae. So it's uh, fully natural and even even food grade material. So it has been used like making candies or, or the like. So it's super safe and actually is super available at a really low cost. So we foreseen that the main components, the exchanger and the absorber materials would last at least three years. And even if we would need to replace each three years in order to have it set uh, original operational capability, this would be a very low cost because it's very common chemicals. The news is then the way we built up, basing on simple chemicals, the way we built up the, the, the materials, the polymer, in order to have the better exchange with the water. And if we talk about in terms of the actual product, the water that's produced, what sort of quality are we looking at? What what have your test results shown you so far? Well, the water is uh, basically like distilled water. So it's a really low mineral quality. It's even can be seen as pure H2O, pure water. The interesting thing is that in this process we are using, nothing is captured from the rest of the atmosphere. We made analysis, we made tests at the certified laboratory in Torino at uh, SMART, the local uh, utility of water, which also sent water on a space station, just to say it's a very qualified <laughs> laboratory. So uh, this laboratory searched for a wide range of uh, elements that can be in the air, some dangerous materials, etc. more than thousand actually they checked thousands of components and we didn't find anything in water uh, but water something actually is depending on the cycle so if uh, you're using some plastic in the machine you might find some plastic in the water and actually that was to be totally sincere what uh, actually was there something that we put there but nothing from the atmosphere that's very interesting so it's a super selective process and the water is uh, pure water no acid level in it and that's a very good uh, starting point if you want uh, to make a very specific uh, irrigation mixer for your water you start from zero and you add whatever you need to add to the water for your uh, irrigation process you know i have a natural bias towards wine so if, if i was talking to a wine producer in a water stressed area the first thing they're going to say is yeah but how scalable is this thing how what does it look like how big is it is it a is it a great big truck that I need to park on my field? How can it scale? Is, yeah. it, is it really feasible? The core system that is like a, this exchanger, it's uh, totally scalable. So you can make it like a small radiator, like the one you have in your chiller, it's like that, or large as the radiator of a truck, or a larger, you put 100 of these truck radiators, you've got the biggest radiator you can imagine for a big plant. But just to give an idea of the sizes, like uh, if you think about the 1,000 liter per day machine, this can be like uh, three meters times one times 1.5. So it's roughly it's three cubic meters, like like to say a machine to have 1,000 liter, 1,000 liter per day machine. This machine will need to be supplied with energy. So. That's where maybe some additional spaces are needed. So depending on the source you are considering, and there will be another need. So if you're thinking about photovoltaics, because we can drive the system with electricity and you can do it with photovoltaics for a machine of 1,000 liters per day, 
the energy needed would be in the range of a few hundred meters of photovoltaics, like 200, 200, 300 meters of photovoltaics. Can you give an overview of some field experiments or case studies that you've done so far and what you've learned from them? Yeah. Yes. Well, let me say that we are a very young company. So we are a startup and we incorporated in July 21. So our current uh, development is of uh, laboratory machines and experimental machine. Anyhow, we, in the last uh, summer, uh, 2022, uh, we delivered three small machines of capacity around one liter per day. So very small prototypes that we employed, especially to, to test uh, the process and then to analyze the water and to test the concept. And then we delivered this in Pantelleria to a local winery uh, that collaborated with us and was uh, very interested in having uh, some available uh, alternative water source because you might know in Pantelleria that is a volcanic island. There's no spring water available and the water from desalination is uh, not uh, allowed to be used for, for agriculture. And also the winemaker would not have to use it anyhow because he would say it's a bit acid and it's kind of ruined uh, my my plant. So he was looking for pure water with uh, no acidity inside and no additional stuff. And so we made this exercise and actually our machines generated uh, some tens of liters of water in Pantelleria, remotely controlled. And the winemaker uh, used this water mixed with other rain water he was collecting to, to make this uh, experiment on, uh, on the wine. And actually, we, we, we still, we don't know yet what has really the results that have been on the quality of the wine, but uh, we had this water available. I think it's an interesting experience that we would like to scale up. Okay, so you had a proof of concept. And the, another use that you've talked about is humanitarian, and there are water stress yeah. areas. Is this a technology that you think is useful in those scenarios? Yeah, I, I totally think so. Like, uh, you know, that uh, water availability in some scenario means the difference for a child to survive, for a newborn to survive one, two or three days after he just came to the world. So we already had in the past contact with uh, some ONG to work, uh, NGO, sorry, <laughs> I was the Italian, the NGO to, to, to work in South Sudan, the, the place of the world, the world with the highest uh, uh, newborn mortality rate because they don't have water in, uh, in when when they are delivering, they don't have water. And so there is so high mortality rate. But also we are planning uh, to collaborate with the World Food Programme. And they have like in, in Italy, in Brindisi, they have a, a huge logistical base. And uh, we have an agreement between the Politecnico di Torino where our research come from and actually comes also from Princeton University. We are a joint <laughs> yeah. effort between two research centers. But we have uh, an agreement with Politecnico and this uh, facility to develop technology that can be delivered to any UN agency in the world. And the plan is to, we already had uh, some discussions to receive from them uh, suggestions and uh, specifications for the machine that actually can be useful, like uh, uh, how will it be delivered, like with a helicopter or trucks, what are the sizing and uh, how many liters per day and what are the issues with uh, uh, using a similar system in a humanitarian uh, like emergency camp and etc. So actually we are looking after this a lot. Okay, that sounds fascinating. And on a little bit of a timeline, what are your milestones going forward from today? Yes. Well, we are actually closing a second round of uh, raising funds. And this second round foreseen a program of industrialization of uh, products that will end by the end of 2024. So in this 2023 and 24, we will make some demos of uh, large and small machines to qualify the technology and to have feedback from some users. So this uh, demos project will be also very important to optimize the product that will be eventually industrialized by the end of 2024. And so the plan now is to have in 2025 to have the first cell. It sounds really exciting. I hope we start seeing these kits deployed to plug the water crisis that we're, we're sort of yeah. sailing into at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.